Welcome to another tutorial video. This time around, we're going to be looking at the yield to maturity on bonds and see a quick method you can use to approximate it without having to enter a long formula or a lot of complicated Excel functions. So with this tutorial, we're going to start looking at concepts relevant to debt capital markets, DCM, and leveraged finance, LevFin teams. This tutorial and a lot of the other ones on these topics will also be relevant if you're in restructuring or distressed M&A, or you're interviewing at a credit fund or anything else that's debt related. So this lesson will be divided into four parts. In part one, I'm going to tell you about the yield to maturity, what it means and how to think about it intuitively. Then in part two, I'm going to show you a way to quickly approximate it. In part three, we're going to extend that quick approximation formula to the yield to call and yield to put. And then in part four, I'm going to show you how to use this quick approximation in real life to make decisions quickly when it comes to advising clients and then also investing on your own. Let's go into part one and talk about what the yield to maturity on a bond means. The formal definition is that it's just the internal rate of return, the IRR that you get from buying the bond at its current market price and then holding it to maturity. Let's go into Excel and take a look at this. You should already be familiar with the IRR from previous lessons relating to leveraged buyouts and growth equity investments, for example. But just to refresh your memory, you pay upfront in the beginning some amount for the bond. Here, we're assuming that the bond's par value is 1,000. It is trading at 90% of that. So you could today buy the bond for 900. So you invest the 900, and then the coupon rate on the bond is 5%. So you get 5% of that 1,000 par value. In other words, 50 in interest per year. And you get those annual interest payments all the way up through the bond's maturity in 2024 here. We're assuming it's a 10-year bond. And then, of course, you also get the principal back at the end of 1,000. So just like the IRR in a leveraged buyout tells you what the private equity firm could earn on its equity investment in the company, it's the same principle here, except you're just investing in a single bond. And if you look at IRR and apply it to these cash flows, you will get 6.383%, which is exactly the same as the yield to maturity on the bond. Now, a couple of assumptions have to be true for this to work. First off, you have to hold the bond until maturity. Otherwise, this makes no sense. Second, you assume that the issuer, the company, pays all the coupon and principal payments in full on the scheduled dates, which may or may not happen in real life. And then third, you assume that you reinvest the coupons at the same rate. So just like the IRR calculation is sometimes a bit suspect because of this reinvestment assumption, the same is true with the yield to maturity calculation. Now, the intuition behind this is that you're trying to get to the average annual interest rate percentage on your investment plus the capital gain or loss percentage you earn each year from the bond. So here, for example, we know that we're getting around 5% in interest each year on this bond from the coupon rate. And we also know that it's trading at 90% of par value, which means that over a 10 year time frame, because the bond maturity is 2024, we buy it in 2014, we will earn on average about 1%, we go 1% closer to this bond par value of 1000 each year, we add the 1% to the bond coupon rate right here, which gives us about 6% if you add them together. And the 6% is actually very close to the actual yield to maturity and the internal rate of return on the bond. So that's one way you can think about it. Now to calculate the yield to maturity, you can use a built in Excel function, the yield function and you enter the settlement date, in other words, the date you buy the bond, the maturity date, the coupon rate on the bond, 5% here, and then you enter the bond price as a percent of par value out of the number 100. If you see a few examples, you'll see what I mean by this. Then you enter 100 because you assume that the company repays it at par value upon maturity, and then you enter the coupon frequency. If we buy the bond on December 31st, 2014, we hold it to 2024, we get that 5%. It's trading at 96% of par value right now. And the company repays it at 100% of par value. We get a yield to maturity of 5.5% using this built-in function. I have another example down here for slightly different numbers. And then another method of calculating it, rather than using the yield functions, as we did here, you can also use the IRR function. And 
you can go in and project all the cash flows and use IRR. The downside is that this is only going to work if you are looking at annual periods and you have annual coupons. If you have something different, the numbers are going to be slightly different and you're going to have to modify it. We're not going to get into it here because we're focused on the quick approximation. Speaking of that quick approximation, here is a shortcut method to calculating yield to maturity, which ties directly into that intuition and the rule I just gave you for thinking about it. To approximate it, you can take the annual interest payment and then you take the par value minus the bond price divide by the years to maturity. This top part is essentially giving you how much in interest you're earning each year and then what kind of capital gain or loss on average you're getting each year from holding the bond. And then you divide by the average price over this period. So you get the par value back at the end, you pay the bond price today, you're just taking the average between those. And I've laid out the intuition here. You get the interest on the bond each year plus a gain on the bond if it's purchased at a discount or a loss if it's purchased at a premium. And then you have to look at that on the average between the initial bond price and the amount you get back upon maturity. So in that example I just showed you where we said that we get on average about 6% here because it's trading at 90%. So we get 1% back each year as it approaches maturity and then we get the 5% coupon rate. The reason it's not exactly a 6% yield to maturity is because of exactly what I just mentioned, that we have to divide this by the average between the bond's par value, 1,000, and its price, 900 right here. Now, if we took out that term, take a look at what would happen. We would actually get around 6% here. The units are messed up because of how it's calculated, but we would get to around 6%. But since we have an average price of 950, that is going to change our function right here. You can see that in this case, this approximation actually works pretty well. The real yield to maturity is 6.383%, and our approximation is 6.316%. And if you work through the math, you can see why it works well in this scenario. So if we have a 10-year $1,000 bond with a market price of 900 and a coupon of 5%, the annual interest is just 5% times 1,000, which is 50. Par value minus bond price is 100. And then the average between the par value and the bond price is 950. So the approximate yield to maturity is just 50 plus 10, 60. And then you take 60 and divide it by 950. Now, if you can't do this math in your head, that's fine. You can still come up with a quick approximation because 60 divided by 1,000 is 6%. So 60 divided by 950, therefore, has to be more than that. So you can figure out that it's going to be a little bit above 6% here. 6.3% is what it actually comes out to. Now, there are some limitations of this quick approximation method. First off, it's not going to work as well when the bond trades at a big discount or premium to par value. This is not common for healthy companies, but you see a lot with distressed companies and companies in the midst of restructuring. So for example, if we change the trading price to 50% so that the bond price is only 500 versus a par value of 1,000, this approximate yield to maturity function is quite a bit different. We're now at 13.3% versus 14.94% for real. So that is one limitation of this. Another limitation is that if the settlement date and the maturity date are not lined up or you have semi-annual or quarterly coupons, not annual coupons, you are going to get different results as well. So for example, let's go in here and let's say in our yield to maturity function, let's just enter our own custom dates here. For the settlement date, let's say June 30th, 2014. And then for the maturity date, let's enter something else so that the number of years stays the same, but the actual period is somewhat different. And let's say January 30th, 2024. Now in this case, it's actually not off by that much. Yield to maturity is 6.424%. Our approximation gives us 6.3%. So it's actually decently close, but it is off by more than it was before. Another issue is that if we had, say, two interest coupons per year, which most US corporate bonds pay, semi-annual coupons, we also get results that are slightly different. And if we get four coupon payments per year, or different once again. So there are some differences and limitations having to do with timing. And then one final limitation is that if the bond has a floating interest rate rather than a fixed rate, so if instead of 5%, we had LIBOR plus 3% or 
the US Treasury rate plus 1% or something else like that. If the interest rate changes over time and you don't even know what those changes are gonna be, this is obviously not gonna work as well. Let's go into part three and look at how you could extend this formula to yield to call and yield to put on bonds. The first thing to note is that just like stocks can have call and put options, bonds can also have call and put options. The reason why a company might wanna call a bond early and repay it early is that interest rates have fallen or maybe the company's credit rating has improved and now it can refinance, get the same bond, but pay a lower interest rate for it. So if the bond has a call option attached, the company can redeem it early, usually at a premium to par value. And then in exchange, the bonds tend to offer a higher yield to investors because the investors are assuming more risk. If the company redeems it early, now the investors get their money back, which is fine, but they have to figure out where else to put it. And they're probably gonna get a lower rate if interest rates have fallen. So that is the basic mechanic of how it works. Here's how you can extend the formula to cover yield to call and yield to put. In other words, the yield when a company repays it early or when investors force an early redemption. It's almost the same. You just take annual interest and then you take the redemption price minus the bond price over the years to maturity and then you take the average between the redemption price and the bond price. Now this redemption price is just the percent of par value that the company has to repay if the bond is called or put early. So for example, if we have a 10 year $1,000 bond with a price of 90, coupon of 5% and a call date three years from now at a redemption price of 103, here's how the math would work for this example. We could take 50, that's the annual interest coupon. And then 1,030 minus 900 is 130. 130 divided by three is about 43, just over 40, you could say, because you know 120 divided by three is 40. And then the average between 1,030 and 900 is 965. So this formula reduces down to 50 plus some number just above 40, we can say. That gives us some number that is just above 90. It's actually 93 or about 93. And then 93 divided by 965, you can just tell from the math, is gonna be just under 10% because 93 divided by 930 is exactly 10%. If you have a bigger number in the denominator, the percentage is gonna be just under 10%. And so it comes out to about 9.7%. If we take a look at how this works in Excel, and let's look at an actual example with those dates here. So the actual yield to call, if we enter everything here, so we have a settlement date of December 31st, 2014. We have an early call date of December 31st, 2017. We have that 5% coupon, and then we pay 900 in the beginning. And then at the end, the company redeems it for 103, meaning that they're gonna pay 1,030 now the actual yield to call is actually closer to 10%. It's about 9.9%. Our approximation gives us around 9.7%. So we're not exactly there, but you can see how this formula would be very useful for coming up with quick estimates in these scenarios. Let's go into the last part here and look at how to use this approximation in real life. So let's say that you're at a credit fund and the fund targets a 10% IRR on its investments in high yield debt. So they're looking at a potential investment from JCPenney. The company has a four-year 7.95% unsecured bond, and it's currently trading at about 91 or 92% of its par value. Now, if you just do the quick math using the formula we learned, it seems like an easy yes, because we get 8% interest per year. We get that 8% discount divided by four years. So it's about 2% per year. So in total, we get around 8% plus 2%, which is 10% divided by an average price of around 96%, the average between 92 and 100. And just from looking at the basic math, you can tell that the yield is gonna be just over 10% in this case, because we have 10% divided by 96%, 10% divided by 100% is 10%. So if the denominator is smaller, our yield is gonna be slightly above that 10%. But the problem here is that a distressed company, as JCPenney was a few years ago, may or may not be able to repay the bond principal upon maturity. Because what if its cash flows worsen? What if it can't even refinance the debt when it comes due and it has to pay extra or it can't meet its obligations? So you have to think about those types of issues. So you've done the analysis and you've come up with approximate recovery percentages depending on how well the company performs. 
65%, 47%, and 13%. Let's look at our quick approximation formula using these percentages. This is exactly like what we saw with the yield to call and the redemption prices, except now our redemption prices are a lot lower than par value. So in scenario one, we still get that 8% interest per year, but we now lose something. So 92% minus 65% is 27%. So we lose 27% divided by four each year. And then we have to divide by the average price of 78.5%. This gets us to a yield to maturity or yield to exit of about 1.6%. Then if you look at scenario number two, it's even worse because now we lose about 45% from when we purchase it to when the company repays it, or we get some amount of proceeds back from it. And the average price is 69.5%. So our yield is negative 4.7%. So the conclusion here, just from very quick math, is that this is probably a no invest decision because if the company can't repay even close to 100%, then there's no way that we're gonna get to the 10% IRR that we're targeting. Even in the upside case, we're not even close. We're at around one or 2%. So this seems like a clear no decision. Let's do a quick recap and summary now. In part one, I covered the yield to maturity and what it means. It's essentially the internal rate of return on a bond when you buy it at its market price, hold it to maturity, and the company makes all its interest and principal repayments on time. Then you learn how to quickly approximate it. Instead of using the Excel function or showing all the cash flows, you can just take the annual interest, the capital gain or loss per year, and then divide that whole thing by the average price between when you buy it and then what you get back at the end. Then I showed you how to extend it to yield to call and yield to put. You just use the redemption prices here instead, but otherwise it's a very, very similar formula. And then in part four, we just went through an example of how to use it in real life. You can quickly look at numbers for bonds and decide whether it makes sense for you to even do more work before you spend a lot of time on a complicated analysis. That's it for this lesson. Hopefully you know a bit more about these concepts related to bonds and the yield to maturity now.